Welcome to Book Club with uh, Jeffrey Sachs. I'm absolutely thrilled to have uh, one of uh, the world's leading experts on international relations and uh, one of uh, the most important voices in uh, public affairs uh, in the world today with me, uh, Professor John Mearsheimer, also a good friend and somebody that I admire tremendously. Uh, Professor Mearsheimer has a very important uh, new book uh, uh, co-authored with uh, Sebastian Rosado, who uh, is a professor uh, at University of Notre Dame, and Professor Mearsheimer is uh, the uh, R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished uh, Professor uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm sure that uh, most or all of you have been listening to uh, John Mearsheimer uh, discuss the events around uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, now wars in the Middle East and so many other issues because he's been the go-to person uh, for so much of the world in trying to make sense of uh, the multiple crises that we're in and uh, the spread of violence. Uh, one of uh, John's uh, truly justifiably famous uh, books is The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, uh, which was written at the start of the new century. And in that book, he said uh, that it seems a little quiet now, but don't worry, or worry maybe, I should say, uh, great power politics uh, will return. Uh, and uh, the book's title that I'm going to discuss uh, with you, John, <laughs> also uh, uh, is uh, about the tragedy of great power politics, and we seem to have a lot of uh, tragedy to go around right now. But the new book uh, that you've written is, uh, of course, completely, uh, completely relevant for uh, our current uh, struggles and uh, trials and tribulations uh, globally. It, it's about how states think, and uh, the gist of uh, the book is about uh, whether state decision making is rational or irrational and what difference it makes. You started writing this uh, during COVID, during the lockdown, so this is a book that you and uh, Sebastian Rosado uh, wrote, as I understand it, largely uh, on Zoom uh, together sure. uh, during uh, the first couple of years of uh, the, uh, the the pandemic, but it became uh, absolutely pressingly relevant in trying to understand uh, the Ukraine war. So maybe uh, if we could start, uh, you could explain the motivation for this book. Uh, you're known as uh, our nation's leading realist uh, thinker in international relations, so it would be good to help listeners understand how you fit into the story and uh, your your views about this, but what's the motivation of writing a book called How Nations, uh, how, how, excuse me, How uh, States Think? Well, there is a widespread perception uh, in the academic world and in the policy world uh, that states, uh, in terms of their foreign policy behavior, are irrational or non-rational. And our view was that if that is the case, most of our theories in international relations about how the world works uh, are largely irrelevant because all of those theories are based on the rational actor assumption. And then we also said to ourselves that if you're a policymaker and you think that states are irrational, how can you possibly formulate some sort of coherent policy? Because you have no idea what other states are going to do because they're basically irrational. They're wild and crazy. And our intuition, uh, in fact, our theories about how the world works, say that states are rational. So what we decided to do was try to figure out whether states are routinely rational or routinely non-rational. And to do that, you have to have a definition of what rationality is, because that has to be the baseline that you then employ to look at past state behavior 
and determine whether or not states have been rational or not. So what we do in the book is we explore what rationality is, and uh, and then we look at the historical record, and we conclude, uh, one might say unsurprisingly, that states are rational most of the time. This is not to say that they don't do irrational things. And a good example of that would be uh, the Bush, uh, George W. Bush invasion of Iraq in 2003. That was clearly, in our opinion, a case of non-rationality. So we'll come to that to, to, to understand that. But in, you know, in our current discourse, for example, it, it has been said uh, almost nonstop, well, you know, you, Putin, he, he's, he's irrational. Uh, he thinks he's Peter the Great. Uh, he's you know, aiming uh, in an illusion to rebuild the Russian Empire. And your argument is, no, this is not a serious way to think about uh, Russia's decision-making or uh, President Putin's role in Russia's decision-making. And if we think that way, we're ourselves going to be led down a, a very a dangerous and inaccurate yeah. path in, in how we deal with the global challenges. Yeah, let me say a few words about Putin, because there's no question that that's the case that almost everybody rivets on these days. Our basic argument uh, is that whether uh, a state is rational or not is largely a function of the theories that underpin the policy uh, that uh, a leader uh, is pursuing. And in other words, if uh, a statesman or a leader has a cockamamie theory uh, that informs the state's policy, then that's not rational. And if you look at the case of Vladimir Putin, this is a pretty straightforward case of uh, Putin and virtually every Russian leader being deeply fearful of NATO expansion. And when it was first announced in April 2008 that Ukraine was going to become part of NATO, the Russians made it unequivocally clear that this was unacceptable, and Putin was in the lead in making that argument. Nevertheless, NATO continued to move eastward and to attempt to bring Ukraine into NATO. And the end result is a major crisis broke out in February 2014, and then you had the war uh, where Putin or the Russians invaded Ukraine in February of 2022. And our argument is that this is a straightforward case of balance of power politics. It's Realpolitik 101. What Putin was doing was balancing against the West. He was balancing against NATO. It's hardly surprising that this conflict has broken out. But many people who are in the war party, and of course this includes huge numbers of people in the foreign policy establishment, believe that he is a mindless imperialist, and anybody who would dare to invade Ukraine for purposes of conquering it and incorporating it into a greater Russia has to be irrational. But that's not what he was doing, right? What he was doing was balancing against NATO. And this is a perfectly rational strategy, and we should have understood that from the get-go. And the fact that we didn't is quite remarkable. And, and one of the, the pieces of uh, evidence uh, strongly in favor of your view is the memo that uh, William Burns wrote in 2008 uh, from his position as then ambassador, uh, U.S. ambassador to Russia. He's now the CIA director, but he wrote a memo back to the Secretary of State explaining it's, it's not just Putin against uh, uh, the NATO expansion to Ukraine. It's the entire Russian political class. Uh, and so it's a complete opposite to the kind of claim that's made that there's some delusional leader. Uh, Burns spelled it out very clearly in a, I think the memo's entitled, Niet means Niet. No means no. Now, interestingly, uh, John, just to ask you about that, that memo would never have seen the light of day, most likely, but for WikiLeaks. Uh, it, it was leaked uh, in, in part of a treasure trove of uh, foreign policy documents. Uh, so much of what states do, especially the U.S., I would say, and other big powers, is secret. 
So how does one assess uh, this kind, the, the real decision making, what people really believe and how states are, are acting? Well, the truth is that it's very tricky to do uh, in, in real time. And, and when you talk about Putin and exactly what his thinking was, uh, it is not easy to put your finger on exactly what is going on. It's much easier to look at historical cases where you have a rich record and you can see what the documents and the memoirs and so forth and so on say about a particular set of leaders and what they were thinking. But I would argue in the Russian case, it's a pretty straightforward uh, instance of a leader and his lieutenants, apropos of the Bill Burns memo, saying over and over how they thought about NATO expansion and what they were going to do. There's no it mystery wasn't, It here. wasn't subtle. No, no, <laughs> it's, it's actually quite remarkable. What's remarkable is that the West paid hardly any attention. Maybe we should say no attention to what Putin and his lieutenants were saying. They completely ignored uh, the Bill Burns memo. And I would imagine that once we get our hands on the historical documents, all the historical documents, we'll see that Burns was not the only one who was telling people uh, at the top of the Bush administration uh, that this was what was going to happen. So it, it does seem to me that Russia's response to this relentless push of uh, NATO to, or of the U.S. to have NATO, a U.S.-led military alliance, expand was, uh, was rational. But maybe uh, to get to that, uh, if you could explain what, what you uh, and uh, Sebastian Rosado mean by the term rational, because it is a loaded yeah. or a, a debated uh, and unclear term. Uh, how do you operationalize that? And since we're talking also not about an individual decision or uh, a, uh, an individual person who could be rational or delusional and so forth, but rather a state. What is a state in this context uh, specifically, and how would you assess whether the state is acting in a rational way? Yeah, this is a great question. Let me just quickly lay out my definition, or my, my and Sebastian's definition of rationality, and then answer your question head on. Uh, our argument is that rationality has two dimensions to it. First is the individual, and then there's the collectivity or the state, because as you point out, you can't just focus on one individual, because decisions are made by a handful of people. There's surely a leader like Putin, but Putin is surrounded by other people who have input, so it's a collective decision or a state decision. And our argument is that at the individual level, what's imperative for rationality is for individuals to have a credible theory about how the world works that underpins their view of policy. We believe that human beings are fundamentally theoretical animals. We call this homo theoreticus. I like and, that, by the way. <laughs> yes. Right. And it, when you, Jeff Sachs, think about, you know, what uh, economic policy should be uh, in Washington, you think about the world as an individual in terms of theories about how the world works. You have these economic theories. And when you look at international relations, you have political theories that inform your thinking. But that's just the individual level. Then there's the collective level, right? And our argument is you're often going to run into situations where you have different individuals who have different theories and therefore favor different policies. And to get a collective decision, to get a state policy, what you have to do in our story is have a deliberative decision-making process. You can't have a process that looks like the one before the Iraq War where Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld suppressed all sorts of uh, conflicting views or views that they didn't like. You have to have a robust and coherent decision-making process. And we argue uh, in, in the Russian case that that's what happened. As you know, it, the conventional wisdom in the West is that Putin was isolated and that he made this decision to invade Ukraine all by himself. 
And there were all these people who disagreed with him, but he exiled them or he didn't listen to them. And it's the fact that he was a lone ranger that makes this irrational. This is wrong, we believe. And in fact, to go back to the Bill Burns memo, the Bill Burns memo makes it clear that Putin was not a loner here, that virtually everybody at the top of the foreign policy establishment in Russia agreed with Putin about NATO expansion. So our argument is, at the individual level, what you had is a set of Russian leaders, including Putin, of course, who were operating on the basis of balance of power theory, right, and therefore had a credible policy, right? And at the collective level, they agreed on what had to be done to deal with the problem. They believed to a person, I think, that, and the Bill Burns memo confirms this, that NATO expansion into Ukraine had to be stopped. And the end result is that on February 24th, 2022, we got a war. And, you know, I think uh, one of the telling documents, again, that really supports uh, your view is the readout, or, or even the, it's almost the verbatim minutes of the Russian Security Council meeting. I think it's February 21st, uh, 2022. Uh, is that right? Yes. Uh, that uh, basically, uh, it's a very or organized meeting, uh, and President Putin lays out the issue, what shall we do, colleagues? Uh, and then he calls on Lavrov, uh, the foreign minister, and then he calls on uh, other experts. Then he calls on uh, people from the regions. And you get a full readout. We very rarely get that from the United States uh, documents because these things are uh, kept secret. I think the Russians uh, wanted this uh, to be understood. But it's actually a very orderly deliberation, and it obviously reflects a lot of orderly processes that repeated it. It's not one person. It's not President Putin pounding the table and saying, we must do this. Quite the contrary. Uh, Lavrov explains, we made this, uh, this entreaty to, uh, or uh, this uh, approach to the U.S., but they sent back a document on such and such date saying they would not negotiate over NATO. And then the next one gives another answer. The next one gives another answer. And then the meeting is summed up by the president. But, it, but it's a very deliberative, orderly process that no doubt you get the feel reflects a lot of orderly attention to high-stakes issues, but actually through a deliberative process. Jeff, can I just jump in here and uh, reflect on one of the insights uh, from our book? Uh, a lot of people believe that when it comes to collective decision-making, when you're at the state level, there's a difference between how authoritarian states and democracies operate. And... Uh, Almost everybody we talk to in the West believes that democracies believe in deliberation. But authoritarian states are the opposite. And what you have is one leader who runs roughshod over everybody else. And this, of course, fits with the conventional wisdom on Putin. He doesn't listen to anybody. He decides what to do. And then anybody who disagrees gets sent to the gulag, and anybody who agrees gets promoted. So you have all these yes men and yes women who are operating under him. This is the way many people in the West think. Our view in looking at all these cases, and we looked at 14 cases in great detail, is that there's no difference between authoritarian states and democracies. In both cases, both sets of cases, you get a small number of people at the very top who make collective decisions. And what you discover in almost every case is when people are trying to formulate policies about grand strategy or how to deal with a particular crisis, what you see is that nobody, including the leader, is really sure what to do. And they're kind of searching around in the dark trying to figure out what the best policy is. Therefore, leaders are prone to listen to their lieutenants about what might be a really good idea. If you take Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel today, whatever you think of Benjamin Netanyahu, he is in real trouble. The Israelis are in real trouble. And they're trying to figure out how to deal with Hamas. 
I am absolutely certain that Netanyahu is listening to anybody who he thinks might have a good idea about how to proceed. And someone like Natalie Bennett, who he might have terrible relations with otherwise, is a very smart man. And I'm sure that someone like Netanyahu will listen to Bennett just because Netanyahu is not sure what to do. And if Bennett has a good idea, he'll take that good idea and run with it. So my bottom line here is I don't think that Putin's behavior is any different uh, in this authoritarian state, which Russia is, than would be the case if Russia were a democracy. You, would, in each case, have a small number of people at the top who make decisions and have a vested interest across the board in listening to others' ideas. I think, uh, you know, I, I that really comports uh, with uh, my uh uh, perception also of China, which is very institutionalized, uh, very bureaucratic. It's, it's been an administrative state for 2,000 years with a lot of discussion, a lot of deliberation, uh, not uh, one person calling uh, any shots at all, but actually really uh, collective decision-making in exactly that way. And I wonder... In a way, there is a, an irony that sometimes happens uh, in our democracy. I, I have a feeling, uh, let me ask you about this, you know, many of the decisions that are taken are taken absolutely against or uh, with no interest in, in American public opinion, though in our you know, self-assessment, uh, uh, democracy also means reflecting the will of the people, but on many of these issues, the people are not asked, they're told, or uh, they're ignored. But often it happens that to get some decision made in foreign policy in our ostensibly uh, public-driven process, the public is lied to. Uh, lied to about the real situation on the battlefield or lied to uh, about uh, the uh, the real reason for going to war and so forth. And so maybe there's even more secrecy and less deliberation in the democratic setting in some cases because you you don't speak the truth. I mean, the, the lead up to the Iraq war was a desire of a small group to have a, a war to overthrow Saddam Hussein on pretextual reasons uh, that turned out to be completely false, maybe even more false than they, they believed, but certainly they uh, were not very much interested in the evidence that, that they were purporting to uh, give to the American people. So it was a deception, and because of the deception, I'm just wondering whether maybe the deliberation is even cut short in such context because too much talk, too much deliberation lets too much of the public in, and they didn't want to let the public in. Yeah, let me uh, directly address this issue, which I've spent a lot of time thinking about. First of all, in the book that Sebastian and I have written on how states think, what we discovered is the public opinion, what the public thinks, domestic politics, uh, and so forth and so on, matters hardly at all in the decision-making process. The elites, a small number of elites, get together and they make the decision. We were actually surprised by this finding. We didn't go in uh, thinking that this was a question we should address, how much domestic politics matters. But we discovered in looking at 14 cases and looking in a cursory way at a lot of other cases that domestic politics doesn't matter. That's point one. Point two is there's no It's amazing. It's a stunning finding and a very <laughs> important one. Yes. And again, it wasn't one that we went in asking about, a question we asked, went into the book asking about. Okay. Second point is that if you are in a democracy and you make a particular decision, you have to sell it to the public. There's no question about that. That's not as necessary in an autocracy. It's not to say it's completely unnecessary because public opinion does matter somewhat, but it's definitely necessary in a democracy. Now, I wrote an earlier book called Why Leaders Lie. And 
the principal finding in that book is that leaders do not lie very much to other leaders, and they lie mainly to their publics. Yep. And you get more lying in democracies than in okay. autocracies. There you go. I, there you go. I believe that. I really believe that. And and, and I think sometimes you just feel it's it's a nonstop narrative and deception. And, and you know, one of the uh, senior people in the, in the Biden administration on another issue, and I don't want to say who and what and what the context was, but uh, I – I said, well, you know, have you weighed in on this? And they said, no, uh, you, you know, only only the, the spin guys uh, in, in the White House uh, have any any role in that right now. It's all about narrative, how you pitch it, not what the substance is. This was, you know, is there really that deliberation over that particular issue? And, and there was very little, actually. Yeah, it, it, it's, you know, when I wrote Why Leaders Lie and – I would go around the country and I would tell people that leaders do not lie much to each other. People found that hard to believe, right? And then when I said that leaders in democracies are especially prone to lying to their publics, people found that hard to believe. But I would just say to you, the reason that people in democracies or the people inside a country are easy to lie to is because those people tend to trust their government. Because yes. after all, it is your government. You expect them to protect you. They're your leaders. So they're primed to be deceived. When you're dealing with foreign leaders, they don't trust each other to begin with. We don't trust Putin. Putin doesn't trust us. And this goes back to 2000 when he took power. Right, It's not just now in 2023. So given that there's not much trust to begin with, you really can't get away with lying at the international level like you can at the domestic level. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's really something.